I want you to take your Bible and uh, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And I'm going to read just one verse this morning. And uh, I want to preach uh, something that God has laid on my heart as I've been reading. Uh, and that is this. If Christ is not raised, and uh, if Christ is not raised from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you may be watching and you may wonder, you know, what is all of the... Uh, the what is all of the hustle and bustle about Easter? What is it all for? Well, for the Christian, this is the day on which all of our faith rests. Uh, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then everything that we do is a complete and total waste of time. We're wasting our time by going to church. We're wasting our time by praying. We're wasting our time by singing songs of praise, by preaching, by teaching. All of this is a total waste of time if Christ did not rise from the dead. But if he did rise from the dead, then it means everything to us, and it changes our total uh, way of life. It changes our outlook on life, and it even changes the purpose for which we believe we have been placed on this earth. So I'm going to do something this morning that I have not really ever done before, I don't think, on an Easter or maybe any time. But I have four ideas that I want to speak to you about that I believe pertain to the resurrection. And I want to tell you what the case would be if Christ had not been raised. And then I want to tell you what the case is if he has been raised. And, and what I want to say to you this morning is this. I want you to understand what it means to you as a believer... Or as an unbeliever, if you're watching this morning and you've never been saved, what does it mean to you if Christ, as we say, truly is alive? There was a French preacher in the 1500s. His name was Blaise Pascal. And he came up with something called Pascal's Gambit, many people said. And what his gambit was was simply this, that if, when you take the two options that you have concerning religious things, you merely need to try and figure out which one makes the most sense. Pascal said this, he said, now consider with me, if Christ is not real, and you have believed in him, and you die and you discover, well, you won't discover because you'll, you won't be conscious anymore, but it, it becomes apparent that there is no such thing as a God. He says, what really have you lost in your life? Uh, but if God is real, and if Christianity is true, and you don't believe, and you die, and you find out that everything that the Bible said was true, then what do you have to lose? Well, Pascal said you have everything to lose. You have an eternity to spend in hell. Well, now I want to be honest with you this morning. I, I don't treat my faith that way. I've not come to Christ and believed upon him because I think that it's the safest of two options. I have come to Christ and I have believed on him because I have found that everything that he has said is true. I have found him to be all that he said he would be and more. And so today as I preach to you, I want to introduce to you, if you don't know him, the Jesus that I feel has been so dear to me all of my Christian life. And if you do know him, then I want us just to celebrate in the midst of a dark time a reality that is unshakable, unchangeable, and unremovable from the reality of our everyday lives. And so I want us to look this morning at the resurrection from 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And I want to read just, just one verse. And this is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 14. And if Christ is not risen... And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Father, help us to preach this morning. With Holy Spirit anointing, God, help me to do through this time what I cannot do without your help and your strength and your power. And God, I pray during this time that you would set my words on fire and you would speak through me and that every person that hears would just, God, understand the clear gospel message. God, my desire this morning is not to come up with some new clever truth or some new clever way to present a timeless message. But God, this morning, during this time, I just want to preach the gospel. Lord, I just want to tell people about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to tell people who are hopeless that there's hope in Jesus. I want to tell people that are broken that there's a mended heart with Jesus. Father, I want to tell people who are lonely that there's comfort in Jesus. 
I want to tell people who are lost that there's salvation in Jesus. I want to tell people who are headed for an eternity in hell that there is a hell to shun and there's a heaven to gain through the Lord Jesus Christ. But most of all, I want to say today, Lord, that the tomb is empty and that you are alive. So help me now in this time do what I cannot do in my own strength and power. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, my strength and my Redeemer. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody watching at home and here said with me, Amen. I want you to notice some things this morning that I want to speak to you about concerning if Christ is not raised. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundational doctrine upon which everything else about Christianity is built. If it is not true, everything else crumbles. It is, you could say, the cornerstone doctrine upon which all else is built. And I believe there's four reasons why the resurrection must be true in order for Christianity to have a leg to stand on. Number one, it speaks to us about the foundational truth of the resurrection because if the resurrection did not happen, then Jesus Christ is a fraud. Did you hear what I said? I said, if he has not been raised, his person is fraudulent. You say, now preacher, what do you mean by that? The great scholar and writer, whatever you want to call him, philosopher, C.S. Lewis, said that there are really only three things that Jesus could possibly be. He could be a liar, he could be a lunatic, or he could be Lord. Now you say, preacher, what do you mean by that? What did C.S. Lewis mean by that? Well, three things are true about, uh, three, one of three things is true about Jesus. Number one, he was a liar. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? C.S. Lewis said, if this is true about Jesus, that means that he came to this earth and he intentionally and knowingly deceived people into believing something about himself that he knew was not true. He was a word merchant, if this is true. He was a swindler, if this is true. So that's one option. The second second option is that Jesus was perhaps a lunatic. Perhaps Jesus came and Jesus did all this preaching in the first century and he said all these things about himself and he genuinely and truly believed them and he believed that they were true but he believed them because, well, how could we say it? His bread wasn't done. He was a little bit off. His elevator didn't go all the way to the top. He was a nickel short of a dollar, however you want to say it. Basically, what C.S. Lewis would say is this. Jesus, if, he, if the lunatic theory is true, was not all there. The third one is this. If what Jesus said about himself is true, then the only thing that he could possibly be is Lord of all. If what Jesus said about himself is totally and completely accurate, then the only response that you can give to him is to give your life over to him in complete submission and total surrender. And if what Jesus said was not true, then he is a fraud. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then he was a liar. Why is he a liar, preacher? Because he predicted in Matthew chapter number 20 that if he was crucified, he would then rise again. You remember what the two men in white apparel said to the ladies who came to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning? They said, he is not here. He is risen. And then what's the next part? Just as he said. So if Jesus Christ was not telling the truth, then he's a total fraud. But what if he was? What if he was telling the truth? And let me tell you a foundational truth about who Jesus Christ is. If he has risen from the dead, then Jesus Christ is both prophet and priest and king. You say, preacher, boy, you're going deep here. Now, just stay with me. Prophet, priest, and king. There had been prophets in the Bible. There had been priests in the Bible. There had been kings in the Bible. What was a prophet? I would say to you that in the Old Testament, a prophet was one who predicted an outcome that would come to pass in the future. The gift of prophecy is spoken of in the New Testament. I would say it's not one who predicts the future, but one who tells the truth that was already firmly established. Jesus was a prophet. Not only because he told the truth, but also because he told the future. How do you know that? 
Tear this temple down, Jesus said. My wife and I watched The Passion of the Christ the other night. I, I was so moved by that scene in the movie. Jesus said, tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. And all those righteous Pharisees began to tear their robes because they were so outraged that Jesus would disrespect their holy temple. But Jesus said, was speaking of a totally different temple that they did not understand. He was talking about his own body. He literally predicted the future. Now, there were prophets all throughout the Bible. So... Just being a prophet doesn't necessarily set him apart. What about a prophet and a priest? You say, preacher, how was, how was Jesus a priest? I would say to you that the primary job of the priest was that he would be an intermediary, a go-between between God and the people. And Jesus Christ came to this earth not only to allow men to see God, not only for men to be able to understand the revealed nature of God, but Jesus also came to this earth so that one day when men die, they would have the opportunity to go to where God is. So listen to me. God sent Jesus to where we are so that we can go back through Jesus to where God is. Only because he's a priest. Prophet and priest. Now there was one priest king in the Bible. His name was Melchizedek. You can find him in Genesis and you can find him in Hebrews. But he's the only person who fits even remotely close to what Jesus was. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says he's a type of Melchizedek. Now if you study in the Old Testament, you'll find over in the book of 1 Samuel that there was a man whose name was Saul and God called him to be king. God replaced Saul as king with a man whose name was David. And the reason God replaced Saul is because Saul had been called to be king, but Saul decided he also wanted to do the job of the priest. And because Saul tried to do a job that was reserved for another person, for a specific person, God removed him from his throne. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a priest. But not only that, Jesus was a king. You remember when Jesus came before Pilate? Pilate asked him a simple question. He said, well, well I mean, king, they, they, tell you, they tell me that you claim to be the king of the Jews. And he said, are you a king? And Jesus said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. People in the first century would have looked at Jesus. They would have said, you're a king. Where's your crown? Where's your throne? Where's your white horse to ride into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday? Why a donkey? If you were a king, where are all the things that go along with kingship? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. See, Jesus wasn't interested in straightening out the kingdoms of this world. Jesus was not interested in conquering one nation or one empire Jesus was interested only in one thing, bringing the kingdom of God to lost sinners. And because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he is our prophet. He has given us truth. Paul, Pilate asked him, he said, what is truth? Pilate should have went back and read what Jesus said in John chapter 8. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus' as prophet gave us the undeniable, unquestionable truth truth. As priest, Jesus gave us access into the holy place. He gave us access to the Father through his sacrifice. Jesus is a king. He said his kingdom is not of this world, but I want to tell you, dear friend, one day it will be. One day every eye shall see him. One day every eye shall look upon him. One day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what Easter tells us is don't wait till you have to bow in judgment, but bow now in surrender and thankfulness in the reality of what he has done. The importance of the resurrection of Christ is not only important to the person of Jesus, but also to the work of Jesus. Let me give you a second thing. If Jesus has not been raised, then guess what's true about him? His work is finished. His work is finished. He's done. Now you say, preacher, I thought Jesus said it is finished. The sacrificial, redemptive work of Jesus Christ was finished when he said, it is finished. But Jesus was not finished. If Christ did not rise from the dead, 
than all of what Bible scholars call the post-resurrection ministries of Jesus Christ would be left undone. Now you say, preacher, I mean, I thought Jesus was just up in heaven sitting at the right hand of God the Father just twiddling his thumbs waiting for the Father to look at him and say, all right, it's time, go back and get, get our church. No, no, I want to tell you there's a whole host of things that Jesus is doing right now, today, in his post resurrection ministry. Jesus didn't walk out of the tomb on the first Easter Sunday morning and say, well, boys, I'm done. It's all settled. There's a whole host of things that Jesus Christ is doing. But if he was not raised, then his work would be finished. What would he be? He would be just another religious nut. He would be just like Buddha who lays in a tomb. He would be just like Confucius who lays in a tomb. He would be just like Muhammad who lays in a tomb. He would be just like Joseph Smith and Charles Taze Wilson and all the other people who have come along and believed that they gained some great insight. He would be just like all of those other people. He would be just another blip in history. But if he has been raised... And I would say to you, his work is not finished. But his work is just getting started. And I would say that through Jesus Christ, in him, we have all that we need. The writer of Colossians said that all things are from him. All things are by Him, all things are through Him, and all things are to Him. John said, not anything that was made was made without Him. You say, preacher, what are these post-resurrection ministries you say that you're talking about with Jesus Christ? Well, let me say to you this morning, if Jesus were still dead, we would not have a high priest. What does it mean that Jesus is my high priest? It means when you pray that you have somebody in heaven who can access the ear of the God of the universe on your behalf. The Father who, according to Isaiah, sits on the throne of His glory. You have someone advocating on your behalf if you're a believer because Jesus Christ is our great high priest. The writer of Hebrews said it best this way, we do not have a great high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet he was without sin. I preached on this recently at my church. Let me just give you a, a, a brief understanding of what it means that Jesus is our high priest. Many of you may have heard this recently, but I just want to say it for those who may not have heard. But when we say that Jesus is our high priest, we speak of one who is a conduit. He's a go-between. See, what we believe about the person of Jesus Christ is that Jesus from eternity past was 100% God. But Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth in, through the virgin birth of his mother Mary, that Jesus Christ added unto himself humanity, so he became, listen to me, 100% God and 100% man. And Jesus as our high priest, because he is 100% God is able to reach up to heaven and, and figuratively grasp onto God. See, you're too sinful to ever be able to reach up and grasp a holy God. But because you have a high priest who is 100% God, he's able to do it on your behalf. But there's more. Because he's 100% man, he's not only able to reach up and grab God, but he's able to reach down and grab you. See, not only are you too sinful to be able to ever grab God, but God is too holy to ever be able to reach down and grab you. So God sent His Son Jesus, 100% divine and 100% human, to be the high priest who is able to reach down to man, reach up to the throne of the Father, and bridge the gap that stands between you and I. That's what Easter's all about. That Jesus Christ removed the barrier of sin and death and the grave that once stood between man and God. He's our great high priest. Not only is he our great high priest, but he's our intercessor. He's our intercessor. He intercedes on our behalf. 
not only is our intercessor, but he's our advocate, a, a legal term speaking. Really, I, I would say the, the best modern sense of that word is to speak of Jesus as, as a defense attorney. Now you say, preacher, well, thank God I have a good one because I'm not guilty. Oh, oh no. You're flat guilty. You're as guilty as sin, as we say. Every charge that's been brought against you is true. Somebody said, I'm mad because people are talking about me. And a preacher said, just be glad that they don't know everything that there is to know about you. And that's the reality of us as believers is that sin from our very beginning was a part of who we were. But Jesus Christ is our advocate, our defense attorney. What does he do in his post-resurrection ministry? Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father. And Blake Dodd knelt down, knelt down in his parents' bedroom on July 14th in 1999. I had come to a realization of the fact that I was a sinner. Not just that I'd sinned, but that in my very nature I was a sinner. See, it's not just the act of sin that makes you separated from God, but it is your nature. So, dear friend... Don't compare yourself to other people. For instance, don't look at other people who go to church and say to yourself, well, I mean, I know what they do, and I'm a whole lot better than they are. Don't look at people throughout history who have committed great atrocities of evil like Hitler, Stalin, and all of these people who have killed and taken so many lives and, and say to yourself, well, compared to them, I mean, I'm much better than they are. Don't look at your own deeds and say, well, I give to the Salvation Army. Well, I help people with their groceries get into the car. Well, I try to be good and honest and I don't steal and I don't cheat on my taxes and I try to be good to my kids and I'm good to my wife and I provide for my family. So I must be good enough to get into heaven. Don't look at all those things because it's not merely the acts of sin that make you guilty before God, but it is the fact that you were born into a world that is cursed. It's under a curse. The whole world is cursed. And you were born with that curse. And the only thing that can help us is that we have an advocate with the Father whose name is Jesus Christ. So imagine this with me. You walk into the courtroom, you're the defendant. God the Father is the judge. Jesus Christ is the defense attorney. You walk in and the judge asks, how do you plead? And your defense attorney says, not guilty. And the judge says, on what basis do you plead not guilty? And your advocate, your defense attorney, your go-between, Jesus Christ says, we plead not guilty on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the judge, God the Father, looks at you and he says about your case, not guilty. Your sin debt is paid. Why? Because you have an advocate with the Father. But not only this, Colossians 1 says he's the head of the church. See, I'm not the head of the church. I'm not somebody special because I'm a pastor. In fact, in my lifetime, pastors have been some of the awfulest people I've ever known. No, I'm just kidding. I was joking about that. But I've met some bad ones. Hey, don't put your faith in me, dear friend. Don't put your faith in people. I asked a question on my Facebook the other day, who, uh, who, who are some of the people throughout history who have inspired you, both one from the Bible and one not from the Bible? And I can't tell you how many people said Billy Graham. Don't, don't put your faith in Billy Graham. He's a great man. Pastors are not the heads of the church. I'm just a lowly under-shepherd. I'm a servant, in fact. But Jesus Christ is the head of the church. All, all people are up in arms this week, aren't they? They're up in arms because many people think that the government is cramping in or encroaching on the rights of the church. I saw people who were fined for having a drive-in church in Mississippi. Many people don't understand why this is happening. I'll be honest with you, in my own heart, in my own mind, I get a little uneasy sometimes when people start encroaching upon my rights as an American citizen. But I don't care how long the coronavirus closes down the church. I don't care if the American government comes in and says every church cannot meet for 18 months. I don't care if the whole world is shut down and buildings are not available for people to gather in. The church is not held together by pastors who stand behind a pulpit. 
The church is not held together by praise bands who get up and sing praises to God. The church is not held together because we get together on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. The church is held together because the head of the church, Jesus Christ, cannot be defeated. He cannot be destroyed. He cannot be moved off of his position. And as long as Jesus Christ is alive as the head of the church, his truth and his church will continue to march on. Jesus is the head of the church. His post-resurrection ministries. Let me give you a third thing. The resurrection is important not only to the person of Christ and to the work of Christ, but, but then also it's important to the gospel message. See, if Christ is not raised, Paul says, then our preaching is empty. And I would put it this way, if Christ has not been raised, then the gospel is a fairy tale. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, Paul gives us a picture of the gospel message. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After this, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians, says, Last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. You say, what did Paul mean by that? Speaking of his encounter with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And if Jesus Christ is not raised, then everything that we believe and we preach as believers is worthless. It's a fairy tale. It's a myth. It's a waste of time. But if Jesus Christ really did raise from the dead, then the gospel, as it was preached thousands of years before Jesus ever came on the scene, the gospel is fulfilled. See, the gospel is based on two very basic essential facts. Number one, Jesus died. I shared this morning in our sunrise service that there's such a thing called the swoon theory. Swoon theory. Well, Jesus didn't really die. He just experienced so much pain, and so much torture and agony that, that it caused him to pass out. And they laid him in a tomb thinking he was dead, but then on Sunday morning, he got up again because he wasn't passed out anymore. He woke up out, out of his painful slumber. As believers, we believe that Jesus Christ literally died. And the second fact that the gospel is based upon is that Jesus Christ not only died, but Jesus Christ lives. He was buried to prove the reality of the fact that he died. And then Paul gives us a list of witnesses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to tell us his body was not stolen, his grave was not vandalized. But the one who had been dead and was buried is now risen and has been seen. And Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he's speaking here on the subject of justification, the gospel. Paul said Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses. And he was raised for our justification. Jesus Christ died not because he was guilty of anything, but because we were guilty. But if Jesus Christ only died, we have a half-baked gospel. In order for us to truly be justified, what does it mean to be justified? It means to be made right with God. In order for us to be totally and completely justified, 
Jesus Christ had to rise again. See, I would say if Jesus only died and didn't rise again, then perhaps he could keep you out of hell, but he couldn't keep you out of the grave. Perhaps if Jesus died, maybe in some way, I don't know, I'm just thinking in, out, out in my own mind, perhaps he was, it was enough to keep you out of hell, but it was not enough to get you into heaven. It was only enough to just keep you in the grave. See, Jesus said in Psalm 16, I really believe this with all of my heart, that it's a messianic psalm. David writes it. and David, unbeknownst to him, is writing about a, a person that he doesn't even know at the time, the Messiah. David says, you will not leave my soul in the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Why did Jesus rise three days later? Why not four days later? Study Jewish history, you know that the reason that Jesus waited four days to raise Lazarus is because he wanted Lazarus to be graveyard dead. Now, what is graveyard dead to the Jews? The Jews believed that the soul hovered around the body for uh, four days, and then on the fourth day, the soul left. That was it. You were, you were really, really dead then. You were just kind of dead the first three days, but on the fourth day, you were super dead. Mary and Martha come to Jesus. They say, Jesus, you're too late. I mean, he's not just dead. He's dead dead. Jesus wanted them to be dead dead because he wanted every Pharisee to know that he had the power of life. And therefore he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. That's what he said. But they believed the body was corrupted after the soul left. Jesus was raised after three days because he did not see corruption. He got up three days later, presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. And Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh death, where is your ability to sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do hundreds, thousands of people have to die from a virus? Why are children harmed? Why do people get cancer? Couldn't God just snap his finger, do away with it all? See, for every action, there's a consequence. When Adam and Eve did what God expressly told them not to do, they introduced something to us that God never wanted us to experience. And that was sin. And that was death. And we live in a world that is cursed by sin. And nothing proves that more than this virus that we're experiencing. And I would say to you this morning that Jesus Christ did not come to this earth and live his life in sinless perfection and die on a cross and be buried in a borrowed tomb and be raised three days later to make your life here all that you ever hoped for. He didn't live and die to make all your dreams in this life come true. He didn't live and die to give you everything that you could ever want in this life. Jesus Christ died and rose again. Not so that you could have a perfect life here. So that you could have access to a perfect life there. In fact, most of the people that are mentioned right here in 1 Corinthians 15 had a very horrible life here by our standards. Some were thrown off temples. Some were crucified upside down. Some were lit on fire. Some were sown in two. 
Some were eaten by wild beasts. My goodness, preacher, who wants to sign up for that? People who realize that 70 years doing things your way is not worth forsaking eternity God's way. People who realize the truth of James, that life really is but a vapor. And really what we're doing here is we're getting ready for eternity. Jesus Christ died so that we would be fully prepared. Let me give you a fourth thing and I'll be done. If Jesus Christ has not been raised, then our faith is totally foolish. Our witness is false. Our faith is without meaning. And our future is totally hopeless. If Christ is not risen, then I stand here before you today as a blabbering fool with nothing to say There's no purpose in you even listening. Christ has not been raised. This is all foolish. And in fact, many people think it is foolish. Many people think that religion at all is a construct of man, a foolish idea. But if I'm right, If what I'm telling you this morning is true, that my faith is not foolish, but my future is very bright. And the future of all of those who don't know Him, very dark. Something inside of us causes us to panic when we get into situations where we don't know if there's a solution. People panic over this virus for several reasons. Number one, because we can't see it. Number two, we don't know how to cure it. And number three, if we were just all honest with one another, We like to be scared more than we like to be happy. I mean, we're just prone, and our disposition is just to worry. You say, preacher, you talking about yourself? Absolutely. I worry when there's nothing to worry about. It's our natural disposition to live in fear and anxiety. I don't want to be cliche this morning, because I've heard a thousand preachers already say this on Facebook and through sermons, but I think it needs to be said. Would it be worse for a person to die from a virus? Step into eternity and meet God unprepared. Though their life was cut short by human standards, perhaps? Would it be worse for a person to live a long, happy life to a ripe old age and then stand before God? unprepared. What if a person lived a short life, but they lived it for Jesus? What would it matter then? Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. 
you're still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead. And he's become the first fruits. Those who have fallen asleep. I don't have hope only in this life. I have hope in another life. And I don't always live like it. But I'm glad that even when I don't live like it, it's still true. It's a song we sing that says, All my hope is in Jesus. Why? Because I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And this morning, I want to just speak just for a few seconds to anybody who may be listening who may not know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. As I said last week, I don't know if God, I, I, would, I would be hesitant to say God sent this virus. I don't know that. I don't think we can know that. I think anyone who says they do know that is just talking fluff. But I do know one thing. God's got a lot of people's attention. Can I be honest with you? He's kind of gotten my attention. I kind of feel like God's said to me through all this, you know, Blake, you've you kind of been asleep at the wheel a little bit. I feel like God's speaking to me, Romans 13, 11, that it's high time for me to wake out of sleep. Perhaps I've been just going through the motions a little bit. And God has snapped his fingers. And he said, wake up, church. I don't know if everybody's woke up, but there's a lot of people wiping sleep out of their eyes. Myself included. And I believe a lot of lost people have perked up. Where do we turn when we face something that we have no answer for? We can't shoot it. We can't blow it up with a bomb. We can't fight a war against it. We can't run from it. can't even see it. What do we do? I believe a lot of people are turning to God for hope and help in a troubled time. There was a man who came to Jesus in John chapter 9. He was blind. Jesus gave him his physical sight. Later he came back in the chapter. And Jesus explained to him that there was something really that he was still missing, something that he was, was even more needful than his physical sight, and that was that Jesus would give him his spiritual sight. And Jesus did just that. He gave that man his spiritual sight. We would say in New Testament church terms that, God, that Jesus saved that man. And Jesus taught a lesson to that man and to everybody else. Yeah, pray for God to do miracles in the, in the physical realm. Yes, pray for God to remove the virus. Pray for God to heal those who are infected. Pray for God to eradicate this from our world. The greatest miracle that God is still doing today is that He's taking a lost person who is blinded spiritually, and he's giving them their sight back. So Isaac Newton said, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. We're going to have what we call a time of invitation or a time of response. And I want to ask you this morning to do something. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close out in a few moments with a song, but for now I just want Brother David to come and just to play something on the guitar. 
And I want you, wherever you're at, if you're in this room or if you're at home watching, I just want you to bow your head right now and close your eyes. And I want you to examine your own heart and your own life. Let me speak to believers first, and then I want to speak to anybody who may be lost, and they may be listening to me right now. If you're a believer and you are like me and you just say, you know, preacher, I just feel like I've been, uh, I'm like you, been asleep at the wheel. How do I need to respond to that, preacher? I, I tell you what you need to do. You need to do this first. You need to repent. You need to ask the Lord. You need to say, Lord, I want you to forgive me for wasting so much time. I look back over my life sometime and I think, Blake, you're 27 years old. You've wasted a lot of time that you could have been spending serving Jesus with everything you had. You may feel that way this morning. Here's, here's what's undoubtedly apt to happen. We're apt to come out of this virus and, and months down the road, we're going to forget. We're going to just forget that we had to miss church for five weeks. We're going to forget about how awful it was to be apart from our church family. We're going to forget about how we felt like God was moving if we don't surrender ourselves to Him totally, completely, and continually. And maybe you want to do that this morning during this time. Maybe you just want to gather your family together and just as I pray here in a minute, y'all pray together and just say, Lord, over this house, help us to keep our hand to the plow, as Jesus said. Let me speak to you this morning if you're watching and you say, Blake, I have never been saved. You don't have to be saved in a church. I was saved in my home. You don't have to be saved in the presence of a preacher. There was no preacher around when I was saved. The only person you need present to be saved is the Holy Spirit. And if He's drawing you this morning to salvation, and I believe He can, And you feel the draw and you feel the compelling power of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Drawing you to be saved. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to respond to His invitation. I want you to respond to the call of God on your heart and your life right now. How do I do that, preacher? It's not nearly as much about what you say as what you do in your heart. Salvation is a heart issue. But maybe you would just say something like this in your heart, but with your mouth. Father, I am a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I cannot save myself. And I ask you to save me. I believe Jesus Christ died and rose again to pay for my sins and to defeat death. I ask you to save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not about a fancy prayer. It's about a heart of surrender. If you have been saved this morning, I would love to speak with you. If you're a Guy, I'd love to be able to talk to you more. Maybe you're a woman who's been saved, and we've got some ladies who would love to talk to you as well. Would you just send us a message through the Facebook page right now? Do it now. Don't say, I'll do it in an hour, and I'll do it in two hours. I want you to do it right now. If you just prayed to receive Christ, I want you to message us right now and say, I prayed to receive Christ during the invitation time, and I want to talk to somebody about what I need to do next in, salva in my salvation. I want you to do that right now. Text us. Message us right now, and let us know you've been saved. Be wonderful to say, today's the day of salvation for you, Easter Sunday, 2020. You could tell people we weren't even in church. A saved watching service on Facebook. Be a wonderful thing. Well, it's been the strangest Easter that we've ever experienced, hasn't it? And yet here we are, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Let me just read you a passage of Scripture before we sing this song. 
I shared this the other night when I did a Q&A. Somebody asked me, said, why, does, why do bad things happen to good people? Somebody may ask, you know, during this coronavirus time, where, where's God in all this? Where's God in all this destruction? Habakkuk the prophet asked God a similar thing. He saw the enemy destroying God's people. And he felt like God wasn't doing anything about it. Habakkuk said, Lord, where are you in all this? He and God had a few back and forth discourses. God explained to him that he doesn't understand how God works. And he never will. And you and I never will. His ways are higher than our ways. Thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And just to be honest with you, it kind of gives me comfort to know that I have a God that I can't totally understand. I'd question how godly he was if I could know everything about him. He's above me. And here's what Habakkuk said about God. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on the high hills. Habakkuk said, I don't understand it, but here, here's what I know. Even when everything around me is not as I think it ought to be, I'll still praise the Lord. Because He's good.